Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, I was doing the live session and I gave it about 10-15 minutes and nobody turned up so um, I'm going to give you a more polished version of the uh, slides for today. I get it, it's week nine. Um, you guys are probably uh, bogged under with work for other classes and for this one too. So uh, uh, let me get on with this for you and uh, give you something brief for you to look at on the law. Uh, let me get my screen sharing going here. I want to address some of the questions I've had by email in this as well so that we cover everything there. Okay, so agenda for today is a group work, CSR review, and then we're going to move into the law specifically. So group work, you had the latest uh, assignment uh, last week, I believe. Um, you're going to have your final third ex assignment for that today. Uh, that we sent out, and that's going to be to do with intellectual property. So you will see that uh, at some point uh, before the end of today. Um, I hope you guys are working your groups perfectly and getting on. Um, I will be grading the group work. Um, you probably won't see the grades for that till you see your final grades or just before the final. Um, and your feedback form for your whole group, I'm going to just going to do one form. You know, going through 45, 46 forms three times just doesn't make a lot of sense for me. So I would rather have you grade your group members just once for participation in all three group projects, and then I will. Uh, I will put that into the grade, okay? The CSR review that is on the schedule but not on the syllabus um, was just something that I put in there as a placeholder. Um, that's my bad. It was meant to be one of the group activities, but instead I've had you deal with the, uh, you've got the intellectual property, you have the issue, and then you have the lobbying paper. So it's the lobbying paper that you have instead for that. Okay, so moving on to today's slides. So. I'm going to talk about the law today. So something there is, uh, I'm not sure if any of you have covered much in law, is common law, which is used in the UK, the US, uh, most of the former English colonies. Uh, and what it means is that each party in, um, in a clash gets to, uh, say, to give its, its opinion, and then judges and juries make decisions based on that. Um, the idea of common law is that it helps people accomplish what they want to accomplish, um, and the advantage of common law is it can adjust to changing circumstances without waiting for the law to change. So you don't have to wait for new legislation to come through. Judges make decisions which often lead to new legislation. Um, you know, I always talk about uh, the compensation culture that's arise, um, and that's because of judges actually going through and, and, and awarding compensation. Um, as that happens, more people can push cases, etc. There's precedent set in the law. Um, and, you know, as the book talks about, you know, common law evolves um, through lawsuits filed by people in response to problems that they need addressed. So, you know, moving on from common law, we're going to talk about intellectual property, which is a big thing in, in, in the business world. So, you know, intellectual property, you have to think about the benefits to society from the use of the ideas and inventions and the incentives for their creation. Now, so when we look at uh, intellectual property for someone like Apple, the benefit to society isn't very high. So with that in mind, the, um, the incentive for creation is higher, it's more highly protected, and so that's why we see these big lawsuits between Samsung and Apple, you know, fighting over who, pre who, who prepared something and things like that. The flip side is things like, um, drugs, medicine for, for use for uh, targeting AIDS, cancer, diabetes. Now, initially, a, a drug firm will put a lot of money into investing in that product, and then they will hold a patent for a certain period of time. And once that patent expires, you then get the generic versions of the drugs. Um, the reason that it's set in that way is to still give the business an incentive to create something, without it going suddenly mass market. Because if you knew that if you created something that cured all cancers, um, and immediately you would, it would have to be sold at a rate that uh, basically made you make a loss on the discovery of this, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't try and uh, make that development. So there's no, there's no incentive to do it. So, uh, but at the same point, you can't have it so highly priced that only the elite can afford to have their cancer uh, cured, for example. That's an extreme example, but that's that's basically how the whole of the theory behind intellectual property uh, works. 
And then as you get into lawsuits, you have the appropriability of the returns um, from a discovery of a breach of, of intellectual property is based on two, two principal factors. So how easy is it for others to replicate the discovery or the invention and the strength of the public, public protection for the discovery? So that kind of brings us into this chart here, which shows the appropriability of returns. So if the cost of replication of something is low, doesn't take a lot of effort to, to, to copy it, um, there, and the intellectual property protection is loose on it, so maybe there's no patents filed at things, there's a weaker probability of returns, so that's a court awarding rewards. On the other end, of course, you have typed IP, so patents for, filed, Apple files thousands, if not millions of patents a year with the US Patents Office. And there, you know, I, I pick Apple because they're just one of the big people who do that, but Facebook has patents as well on, you know, and you can't, you can patent more than just a design, you can patent a process, an algorithm as well. Um, and if the cost of replication is high as well, you have a strong appropriability here. What's interesting, and I really like this um, from the book here, that's why I'm using the book slides on this, is, uh, is how, um, is how the technology is moving things. So for example, you know, it used to cost a lot to replicate, well, you cut, you, it was pretty much impossible to replicate vinyl when, when all music was sold on vinyl, so it was hard to move here. But then as internet and peer-to-peer -peer technology came in, you know, it became very easy to duplicate uh, records, to duplicate music. And so you know, it moved from being a high cost of replication to a low cost of replication. Um, I think I saw a page the other day that uh, even Kanye West was using the Pirate Bay, and not that I'm advocating that, but um, you know there was that low cost of replication there. And then uh, you can see that costly enforcement often brings um, the strong appropriability down to moderate, moderate appropriability. Um, you know, you have to wear up as a business whether it's worth going into that battle. Um, and I think that's something you know we see with, with Apple and uh, and Samsung are the biggest uh, the biggest people that, that go for that. As I mentioned already, you've got patents, you've also got copyright, so you can have copyright uh, on, on, on various things, and then trademarks, trade secrets. The, the Colonel's uh, KFC uh, seasoning is, is definitely a trade secret. Um, I'm loving it, trademark, um, just do it. Uh, I'm sure you guys can think of a lot of things um, in, that, in that area. But uh, you know, a patent um, establishes a property right that, that allows the holder to exclude others from using the invention. So it gives you a, a temporary monopoly um, or potentially a permanent monopoly. You know, no one can um, use Mickey Mouse, for example. Uh, that wouldn't be a, sorry. That wouldn't be an example of a patent. That would be a, a copyright. So a copyright would be on you know works of original expression. Um, so music, um, art, things like that, um, and you can claim copyright on anything, even with, you don't have to uh, file something with the government, you know, patent, you have to file with the patent uh, authorities. But copyright, if you wrote uh, a book that was, that, was, uh, that was published in some way, if you put it to a website, and you can show when it was to the website, and then you thought that somebody copied your idea in their book that went on to become a multi-billion dollar movie, you could sue them for breach of copyright. Um, my recommendation is if you're ever in this sort of situation, you ever post something, you make sure that you post it and you know when you posted it um, because that, 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 that's a key part of it. Uh, as I mentioned, trademarks, trade secrets, uh, they can include process information, operating methods, programs, business plans, all sorts of things like that. The next area we have is contracts. Um, they're governed by common law and uh, they have statutes pertaining to particular types of contracts and transactions. So um, they entered into to make sure that, uh, that, that both parties uh, adhere to conditions. Um, and it's an agreement that people have got to. Um, unions have contracts, you have uh, contracts of employment um, and you know contracts of supply, contracts of performance, all sorts of things. Um, uh, and it's good to know about these as a uh, as a business student, although you're definitely going to be wanting to have a lawyer involved with most of these. Unless you're a small business owner, of course. If you're a small business owner, you know, it helps to know these sorts of things and, you know, to make sure that you uh, look into things as you patent and as you copyright and as you build that brand, you know, check that no one else is using your business name, things like that. 
So contracts, the enforceability. Uh, central issues in contracts are which contracts are enforceable, uh, when can they be breached, and what damages are due in the event of a breach. So a contract can be voided um, if, for example, the person who signs it does not have the authority to enter into it. So somebody who's a minor would not have that, uh, that opportunity. Um, another example is, is the a contract to sell one's vote in an election. And um, that's voidable because the right to vote is inalienable, um, so it's not transferable at all. Uh, contract is not generally enforceable if it is illegal or unconscionable, um, and it's voidable under certain conditions such as fraud or a mistake. And another situation that can make a contract enforceable uh, is a frustration of purpose. So breaches are allowed uh, because under circum some circumstances it's economically efficient not to fulfill the condition um, of the contract. So for example, if a change in the market makes a necessary input to the production process prohibitively expensive, it may be better to breach a purchase contract and allow the buyer to contract for a product made with different inputs. So it might be in the benefit of both people who are involved with it. And then when it comes to the court, they can remedy it uh, with two basic um, uh, events so they can ask for damages or they can specify a uh, certain performance so you know those damages can include uh, um, both um, harm caused and punitive um, and they can be things such as uh, consequential damages reliance damages liquidated damages um, and when it comes to performance um, specific performance in cases uh, in which it's difficult to determine the actual damages incurred as a consequence of a breach, the courts may provide relief in the form of a specific performance. So that involves an order directing the promises to take the actions called for in the contract, for example. So torts are civil wrongs, so they're wrongs done by one person to another. The law of torts is, torts is common law that evolved through decisions made by judges in cases brought by private plaintiffs. So this goes back to the compensation culture that I, that I spoke about. So the basic elements of a tort case is that there's an injury and there's an action that caused an injury and a breach of duty um, owed to the injured party. So one of the most common torts is product safety. So you can see here we have the line through the middle that has the concept, research and development, design, manufacturing, marketing, use of the product, and then suddenly the injury occurs here. You can see that this happens within the domain of the producer and this within the domain of the consumer. At the point of the injury, often you will see regulation put in place, which could come from the design through to the marketing, to ensure that um, the injury doesn't happen again. And of course, you can also have the, um, the liability aspect, uh, which can you know, cause damages to be paid uh, in many sections. So you know, product safety issues that cause injuries lead to both the liability issue, the cost of the company, and regulation from the government to potentially prevent those sorts of things happening again. Really great slash horrible example um, is I'm not sure if you realize why coffee now comes in cups that say may contain hot liquid um, but it was a woman who bought coffee from McDonald's and she spilled the cup over her lap and she got badly burned from it um, and as a result of that she sued McDonald's and was successful and so now part of the marketing they changed the cups to say beware this cup contain this cup contains hot liquid this drives me crazy crazy i'm looking right at you this drives me crazy how can you buy coffee and not realize it's hot liquid I, I and i can't believe a judge awarded this this is in my opinion one of the problems with society is that we have this sort of thing um and it really is it's incredible that that happened um and it causes a problem that then you have this consistency, you know, oh, something was too cold, something was too hot. Product law, law, law the law drives me crazy in so many ways. Um, my father's business, um, he used to have a business, he used to be in a business um, and they had a, like a warehouse unit and there was a worker there um, and he put down a box and then he turned, carried on doing his work, then fell over the box that he placed there and he sued the company and won. 
incredible. Absolutely incredible that judges award these sorts of things. Um, uh, and feel free to uh, set something up on this, you know, drop something in the help forum discussion board too if you have an opinion on this sort of thing. Um, but it just seems like the law is, is out of control with compensation. Um, similar with car accidents, everybody has whiplash, everybody needs this. You know, if there's a genuine cost to it, absolutely, I agree. But so many people milk the situation for the couple of thousand dollars of damages they can get as well as getting paid for chiropractory or massage or something like that. Uh, I just think it's, it's, it's out of control sometimes. Anyway, moving on from that. So uh, entitlements and their protections. So there's rules for protecting um, entitlements in terms of the property rule and the liability rule. So the property rule prohibits other parties from infringing the entitlement without the consent of the party holding it. And the liability rule protects an entitlement in quite a different manner. So when an entitlement is protected by a liability rule, a person may infringe the entitlement but must compensate its holder for the objectively assessed harm resulting from that infringement. Um, what I would say is that I don't need you to know the ins and out of the law for your final. Um, I need you to know what a contract is and what a, uh, intellectual property are. Don't worry. I, I, you're not training to be lawyers. You don't need to get into the, to the ins and outs of this. Um, so, uh, just keep it at a, a managerial overview level. Um, Product liability, as I mentioned, is a, a branch of the common law of torts. Um, common law of uh, product liability has evolved considerably since the 1950s, uh, with legal standards originating in the law of contracts, evolving into a standard of strict liability, under which a producer may be held fully responsible, even if it was not at fault um, for the injury. So implied warranties are not made by producers, but are held by the courts to be associated with a product put on the market. So products are held to have an implied warrant of merchantability. So basically it means if you put a product out there, um, it's assumed that there's a warranty, um, that it's actually sell sellable, which makes sense, right? Um, at the turn of the 20th century, state laws generally required privity of contract in which a party incurring a loss of property associated with the use of a product could sue only the party from whom the product had been purchased. You know, what's important here is that um, you don't just have federal level, you also have state level. And sometimes the federal overrides anything that's done at state level, but you, as, as certainly in the United States, something to take note of as well. So make sure that you're looking at both those things if you're getting into products which could be held accountable. Um, there are some allowable defenses under strict liability. Um, some defenses are allowed, um, but again, as I mentioned, they vary among the states. So in all of these defenses, the burden of proof is on the defendant. So it's, it's your ability, it's you who has to prove um, that there's an issue. The only absolute defense is that the product was not associated with the injury or was not the proximate cause of the injury. So that's the only way you can absolutely close something down is say, well, this had nothing to do with our product. Um, other defenses aren't, a, aren't absolute. So, you know, one is based on the assumption of the risk by the consumer. Uh, the correction of a defect may also provide a degree of protection in some instances. In some jurisdictions, the defense of contributory negligence on the part of the plaintiff is allowed. So the, the person who's had the injury contributed to the injury by doing something stupid. <laughs> um, a producer may also be able to use disclaimers to uh, limit liability, but the court have held some disclaimers um, to be invalid. So even the cup may contain hot liquid could potentially be overruled at some point. Um, in most jurisdictions, product liability cases are covered by a statute of limitations. Um, you know, statute of limitations, you can only bring a court case against something within a certain period of time. Um, uh, and most, uh, most often that's around four years. Okay. So preemption, some federal legislation preempts states from adding requirements beyond those stated in the federal law. Um, which could be explicit or implicit in the law. This is kind of what I was saying, you know, uh, there is certain um, states that may want to um, change the law on product liability, etc. cetera, um, but the federal um, government won't allow that to happen. Um, so the federal law kind of overrules everything um, in this area. 
Um, damages that are awarded um, in liability cases are uh, compensatory, so their compensation for the loss uh, occurred. Um, you know, you, the, in most jurisdictions, they can also assess punitive damages, um, and that tends to cost more than the compensatory damages, uh, and generally requires the company to be found negligent um, or, or, or at fault with this. So that's that's one of the differences here. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, to close off this section on the law, you know, the politics of product liability, um, strong incentives to take liability issues into legislative arena are provided by the costs and consequences of liability cases and the proportion of, of awards that go to trials. Um, liability costs not only affect safety decisions, but they also affect the price of products and in some cases where the products are even produced. Um, if things uh, are, are, are really bad, it could, it could completely um, throw the prices up to, because essentially any costs that are incurred then come back onto, onto, onto the business, onto the consumer in the long run, because the business needs to continue to make money. So um, that's, a, that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a tough situation. So that's kind of the section on the law. Um, love to hear any feedback you have on that, any comments you might have on it. Uh, this is our last live session, so we're going into week 10 next week. As I mentioned, you'll have the next assignment for the group work set today, which will be due at the end of finals week, um, and it'll be the last thing that I grade um, for, for the group work. Um, I will get you a study guide out next week, um, but it's pretty much going to be the chapters we haven't covered. Um, and um, that that will be the main part on the um, on the final exam. So um, it's been fun teaching you guys. I'm glad that many of you have managed to come to a live session, and I uh, I look forward to uh, to reading your your final pieces, uh, looking through your materiality indexes as, as they come up, um, and uh, and I uh, hope you have a good rest of the quarter. All right, thanks very much, guys.